Let's remain standing for the public reading of the word of the Lord. And I want to read this morning from the eighth chapter of the book of Amos. And I promise you we're going to conclude our study in the book of Amos this morning. Amos uh, chapter 8. Amos chapter 8, I want to begin reading with verse 1. I'll read several verses as we're going to try to uh, kind of move through this text. Amos chapter 8, look at verse 1. Thus the Lord showed me, behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come to my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore, and the songs of the temple shall be wailing in the day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere, they shall throw them out in silence. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail, saying, when will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain? And the Sabbath, that we may trade our wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the balances by the seat, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall the land not tremble for this and everyone mourn who dwell in it? All of it shall swell like the river, heave and subside like the river of Egypt. And it shall come to pass, and that day, says the Lord, that I will make the sun go down at noon. I will darken the earth in the broad daylight. I will turn your feasting into mourning and all your songs into lamentations. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like mourning for an only son, and, it, and its end like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, not a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east, and they shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. In that day, the fair virgins and strong young men shall faint from thirst, and those who swear by sin of Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Bathsheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. May the Lord bless and be to the reading of his word. May we be sanctified in our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word, for the word of the Lord. It does bring light to us. It brings illumination. We pray that you speak a good word to us today and help us to see, Lord, those things in which you are pleased with, those things you are not pleased with how we can better our, align our lives to your word, that we might experience your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. And I want to continue the thought we began on last week, this ideal of visions of Israel's condition. Vision of Israel's condition. And as we pointed out on last week, the nation of Israel, they were suffering from an illusion. They thought they were doing well because the economy was booming. Uh, those who had money and real estate and owned businesses, uh, they were experiencing record profits. They were building palatial palaces. They were eating voluptuous meals, but they were not taking a spiritual inventory in terms of where did they stand with the Lord? How did God evaluate or assess their spiritual condition? And so God raises up the prophet Amos from the southern tribe of Judah and bring him to the northern kingdom of Israel to prophesy against them. And so Amos has brought a railing indictment against them. God used Amos sort of like a special prosecutor. And so Amos had absolutely no loyalty to the king, 
of Israel, no loyalty to the, the priesthood, but he was just God's mouthpiece bringing a spiritual indictment against the nation. And as we said on several weeks, there were two major areas of complaint that God brought against Israel through Amos. One was the fact that they were in a backslidden condition and they didn't even recognize it. They didn't even acknowledge it or realize it because they had created a dual system of worship where they maintained the worship of Jehovah, the true and the living God, Yahweh, through their temple system, while simultaneously they had erected shrines to worship pagan idolatrous gods that allowed them to practice gross immorality. So the, the, corrupt, the corrupt religion, the corruptness of the religious practices, it had dulled and it had desensitized them to their responsibility to each other. And that's what false religion will often do. False religion will desensitize us to the humanity of our brothers and our sisters, to those people who are around us. Very often you find in the uh, cult religions, the occultic practices, where there will be a ruling class, normally the men, and they will create a system that allows them to exploit the women and the children, all in the name of God, all in God's order. In the case of the nation of Israel, they established a religious system that was driven by materialism and consumption and greed. And what it allowed them to do was to exploit the working class of poor people. You've got to understand now, in, in ancient Israel, there was no SNAP system, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, better known as food stamps. Uh, there was no WIC uh, for women who were low income and gave birth to children so they could get uh, cereal and milk and juices. Those things did not exist. There was no HUD vouchers. There were no Section 8. There was no public housing. There was no welfare system, period. God had one system. It was called a workforce system, a workfare system. And so what they were supposed to do was to create an economic system that provided everyone with an opportunity to work. Everyone had an opportunity to work. And that's why every tribe, every tribe of Israel, they received an inheritance, except for the tribe of Levi. And the inheritance was land. It was real estate. And so in an agrarian economy, where the farming of crop and where the uh, maintain of livestock, you need land to grow crop, and you need land for animals to graze. Are y'all listening to me? I wish I could remember the exact number, but I understand that I forget how many acres of land it's required to support one cow, one steer, one head of beef. It takes quite a bit. So, so much so, that now scientists are saying that we don't have enough land left on the earth. Now, I'm not making this up, y'all think I'm making this up, I'm not. We don't have enough land really to sustain the population of people that's on the earth because more and more people groups now are eating more and more beef and more and more pork, and more and more meat. You see, we've been one of these carnivorous nations ever since our existence, but many other nations have not consumed the amount of meat that we consume in the United States of America. That's why we have the cholesterol problem, we have the heart problem, we have the hypertension problem, because we've always consumed these meats with all these fats at, in a very large rate, where other nations haven't done that. Well, the other nations are getting like us. They want, they want heart disease, they want cholesterol, they want blocked arteries too. So they're starting to consume meat. So now as other nations consume meat at higher rates, it requires more livestock. And so the scientists say, we can't support all these cows and all of these hogs and so forth. You know what they're going to do? They're going to grow hamburgers in a test tube. Anybody see that? They, built, they, they grew the first hamburger in a test tube. I think it cost $676,000, something like that. But they say eventually they're going to get this thing uh, nailed down where they're being to grow uh, meat in test tubes, in laboratories, and therefore it will not require 
as much acreage uh, for animals to graze on, that means that we can drill for more oil and we can frack for more gas. I know where they're going with it. They ain't tricking me. They're not fooling me one minute. We've got all this natural gas beneath the ground, beneath the rock. They call it fracking where they dig down in and they, they, they drive in there and they put water in pressure and they crack up this rock. That's why they don't want no cows on the land, y'all, because there is black gold in the ground in the form of this oil and this natural gas. So the point is this, number one, their idolatry. Their idolatry led to their exploitation of the poor, and they were oppressing the poor. And God is always concerned when poor people are oppressed. But can I set the record straight this morning? How many of y'all believe that a whole lot of poor people are getting welfare checks? Raise your hand. Now be honest now, if you believe it, raise your hand. I'm glad that y'all are enlightened, most of y'all, because a lot of poor people are not getting welfare checks. They stopped that back in 1996 with the Welfare Reform Act of 1996. It's hard to get a check from the federal government. It's hard to get a check from the federal government. Uh, you've got to be in school. You've got to be working. It is hard. They're not just passing out checks like they used to to women with children. That's a misnomer. And so we are vilifying poor people, particularly poor women with children, as like they're the ones that are consuming up all the resources, and that's just simply not the case. It's simply not the case. Y'all wouldn't believe this if I told them, I'm going to tell you anyway. On the west side of Charleston, on the west side of Charleston, the people living on the west side of Charleston have a higher workforce participation rate. They're working at a higher rate than other people in West Virginia. Most of y'all wouldn't believe that. They're working at a higher rate, but they're working at these places where they don't pay any money. And now they're cutting their hours because they don't want to give them health care. And when the Affordable Care Act kicks in, if they're making, I think, working 30 hours a week, that's considered to be full time, so they're cutting the people's hours, and so people are working at these very low wages and they don't have health care benefits. And a lot of people don't even realize that. So we've created a system to give this illusion that poor people is the problem. You know what welfare is? Welfare is nothing but a way to transfer wealth through poor communities. Where does the money go? It goes back into the economies. If you have a SNAP card to buy food, you spend all your money at the Kroger or at the Fast Check or at the Food Land. That money goes back into the economy. So any money that comes to poor people goes back into the economy. But we create this illusion that the poor are creating the problem. Our problem is that we create a system of education in this country to not educate everybody to the highest level. And that's the problem we have now. We have an educational system that cannot educate people to the level we need them to be educated to. And now we got a real problem, a real problem. A system, don't educate everybody, and now we need people educated to a higher level. He said he's making that, I'm not making that up. Just go back and look at history. If you look at history, Africans couldn't even be taught how to read because they didn't want them to learn to read, because they were brought here for labor. Even after the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment, there was not a commitment to fully educating people in the South. They didn't go to school for four or five months out of the year because they wanted them to be the labor force to drive the agrarian economy to still plant and to harvest the crops. And so we create a system of educational inequality in pockets all over this country. And we move into the manufacturing and the industrial age, it was the same thing. If you looked at those, the series on uh, PBS or the History Channel, the men that made America great, you need to go and look at that. Carnegie and Rockefeller and the uh, Mellons and those folks and those people with the railroads and the steel industry, they wanted to control the labor force, to control the labor force and keep the labor force dependent upon them and keep them in the roles of just being the workers in the factories because that's what they needed, a large number of factory workers, low educational skills, high energy and uh, health and so forth. Now, these are the facts. Now, this is nothing new. This is what happened in Israel. When you read the text in, in chapter 8, in chapter 8, unless you think that I'm making this stuff up, I'm not making it up, 
The people asked the question, and they wanted to know, when was the new moon going to pass? Now, in verses 1 through uh, 3, God has said to Amos, what do you see, Amos? Amos says, I see a basket of ripe fruit. So God was using the basket of ripe fruit at the end of the harvest season as a metaphor that Israel was now ripe for judgment. Now, watch what the people say in verse 4. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor land fail, saying, when will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may trade our wheat and making the ephod small and the shekel large, falsifying the balances by deceit that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. Now, let me interpret this for you. They were in a hurry. They was wanting to know, when is the harvest going to come? God said, the harvest is coming. It's a sign I'm getting ready to judge you. They said, we want the harvest to come so we can further exploit and take advantage of the poor. Look at what they say. That we may trade our wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large. What does that describe? It describes the balances. So we had these balances, and they were supposed to weigh out the food, right? And you weigh out the food, and if it was so many pounds, you're supposed to weigh that out, and that costs so many pounds of silver or whatever. And so what they do, when they weighed out the food, they had a small thing to put it in. But when they weighed out how much the people owe, they had a large pail to put it in. So they were charging people more than what they should have been paying for the goods. They were elevating the prices, and they were in a hurry to do it making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. In other words, they were selling the people inferior product because they could get away with it. It was like having a store, and we don't have any stores like this in the United States of America, but it was like we had a store where they sold stale bread or they sold a, a produce that were past its date that it's supposed to be sold. Or it's like they were bringing in fruit and vegetables, and they would, but this doesn't happen anywhere in West Virginia. They would bring in fruit and vegetables, and they would go into the expensive neighborhood, and that's where they would offload all the fresh fruit and vegetables. But the stuff that's a little bit old, bananas already turning brown, grapes already starting to wither, well, they would drop them off in the poor neighborhood. But in the poor neighborhood, they would pay more for inferior products than they were paying in the more affluent neighborhood for the high-quality products. And God looked at that, and he said, that's not right, it's not fair, and it is not just. And you've been doing it for a long time. You know how you can extort a million dollars? Just one penny at a time. <laughs> <laughs> just, just one penny at a time. If you don't know the power of a penny, well, the governor dropped the sale tax on food by one penny, and it will bring in a lot, there, uh, there were several million dollars in revenue that's not being generated. Now they need the revenue, and they're trying to figure out where to get the revenue from. One penny sale tax on food. So if you're extorting people every time they show up to buy something, it doesn't take long for you to extort uh, out of them millions of dollars. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Y'all think I'm making this up. On the west side of Charleston, over there at one of those uh, stores like Stop, Stop and Go and Seven, I'm going to tell you which one it was. You know what they were selling? You could go in there and buy two cigarettes. You could go in there and buy two cigarettes. You could buy four cigarettes. That was against the law. They're not supposed to be opening no packets of cigarettes and selling no single cigarettes. They did it for years, and to Kenny Hale and a few other people bought it before the legislature and the health department said, so you can't be doing that. So they were taking a pack of cigarettes. I don't know what a pack of cigarettes costs. And none of y'all, I'm not going to ask y'all because none of y'all know either. <laughs> but whatever a pack costs, they were probably getting $20 for a pack of cigarettes. They were selling them, and they would take, you could go, and I want two cigarettes, and they would take a pack of cigarettes already open, hit the side of it, and let two fall down, and let you take out two cigarettes. They were exploiting the people, extorting money away from the people, and people probably paying $20 for a pack of cigarettes. 
It is that type of injustice and it's that, that is unfair that we don't always see how those things happen. And so God looked at that and he said, it's unfair, it is unjust, and I am not satisfied with it. And it is a, one of the twin reasons as to why I'm going to bring judgment upon you. Well, I'm going to move uh, quickly this morning. We have the uh, communion to observe just a little bit later. And so you see there, God says, you are celebrating now and living high on the hog, but, but there will come a time of mourning, verse 10. I will turn your feast in the morning and all your songs and the lamentations. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. And y'all can make fun of me all you want about my bald head. But the time is coming for everybody who have had, who have a little right for the Lord. No, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just, that's genetic, man. That's, that's genetic, right? My sister doesn't have much hair. We got the same, same gene pool. But God says in their case, it was going to be in the form of a judgment. He was bringing judgment upon them. He was going to bring mourning like they were mourning for an only son. And see, we, we don't grip the depth of that. The only son, the firstborn son, the heir. And God says, I'm going to cause the mourning to be so great in the land that every house is weeping and wailing and mourning like they're mourning for an only son, the heir. And then verse 11. He said, Behold, the days are coming, said the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And I have to pray almost every Sunday morning. Well, I pray every morning, but I pray hard on Sunday mornings. I come down to Canoa Boulevard and I pull into the church and I look at the parking lot and we just got a few cars in the parking lot. I look at the parking lot next door, their parking lot is full. They got par cars parked down the boulevard. As a matter of fact, on a couple of days, I've had to ask them not to park in our lot because they don't have nowhere to park. They don't even believe the Bible. They don't even believe the Bible is the word of God. They don't even believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, born of the Virgin Mary, the only hope of salvation. They don't even believe the truths that we hold near and dear to our heart about the Christian faith. But they got a crowd every Sunday morning. And I said to them, I said, Lord, what are we doing wrong? We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in the Bible. We believe in the inerrancy of the scripture. We believe in lift up the name of Christ and and, and, and pleading with people to turn away from their own way and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So sometimes you just got to encourage your own self. You keep doing what you're supposed to be doing by faith, believing in God's own time. God will bring about the consequence. But the text says that there would come a time in Israel where there would be a famine of the hearing of the word of God. That which people now take for granted, they can hear the word of God and have the opportunity to think about and meditate on the Word of God, there would be a famine of the Word of God. Can you imagine what it would be like if there was a famine of the Word of God? There was no Word of God being preached, no Word of God being taught, nowhere where you could go and hear it and receive a good word from the Lord. We ought to take it as a great privilege and a great blessing of God that we have access to sermons online and we have access to Bibles and Bible helps so we can hear the Word of God fresh to our souls and our spirits on a daily basis. But God said for Israel, his judgment will be that they would not have access to the word of God. And then people will be looking for it. They'd be wondering for it, going to and fro, seeking the word for the Lord, but will be unable to find it. Well, as we kind of bring this to a close, chapter 9, I'm not going to go into those gory details. You can read it. It is about the judgment that's going to come upon Israel, the northern kingdom, and how they're going to have nowhere to flee, and how they're going to be slain with the sword, and they'll have nowhere to escape, and there'll be no hiding place, and all the high places that have been their places of worship and of entertainment, of recreation, the places where they had experienced their deep debauchery and sin will be crushed. 
And in verse 9 of chapter 9, he says, For surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among all nations, as grain is sifted in a sieve, yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say the calamity shall not overtake us, nor confront us. And so this is a dark prophecy. This is gloom, and this is despair. But God never leaves his people without a word of hope. And even though the book of Amos has been an indictment, a prosecutor bringing a case against the people about the judgment that was going to come, before Amos could put his pen down, the Spirit of God moved on him to weave into his text a word of hope. In verse 11, he says, on that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David. So even in the midst of the pronouncement of judgment, God is reminding Israel, I have not forgot my promises to my servant David that the scepter rule and reign would never lead from his seed and his offspring. And so even in the midst of the prophetic doom that was going to come, God gives them hope. The tower for David which has fallen and will repair its damages, I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the children of Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does these things. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows seed. The mountain shall drip with sweet wine and the hills shall flow with it. And I will bring back the captives of my people Israel and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them and they shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. And I will plant in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Let me stop right there. This hadn't happened yet. This hadn't happened yet. This is still yet to come. This is a promise that God makes to Israel in 760 A.D. He makes a promise uh, to Israel, in, I'm sorry, B.C. He makes this promise to them before the judgment ever comes, he promises them that one day he's going to restore them to the place that he has promised them through his servant David. And we're yet to see that yet. Israel has not experienced this full blessing yet. This is something still yet in the future. Now what's the word for us? Well, I think the word for us is that sometimes we're like Israel. We're not as faithful as we should be to God in our worship. We're not as faithful as God as we should be in our service. We don't love our neighbors as we should love ourselves. We don't love our brothers and sisters as we ought to love them. In the time that we backbite and we are divisive and we are mean-spirited to one another. In the time that we experience God's chastening upon us and God's discipline upon us, and we can be knocked pretty low to the ground. But God is saying to us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And God is promising to fulfill the promises that he has made to us when we first came to know him as our personal savior. So he says that the plowman will overtake the reaper. In other words, that they're going to be harvesting stuff so fast before they can get it plowed, new stuff is going to be growing up, and the land is once again going to be overflowing with abundance. And God can bring abundance into our lives. God can bring substance to our lives. God can bring fruitfulness where there has been barrenness. God can bring overflowing where we have been dry, where we've been parched, and where we have been suffering from spiritual uh, dehydration and spiritual malnutrition. God can restore those days if we hold on this unchanging hand. And if we keep on believing that the one who's promised us, he is faithful to bring to pass what he's promised and that nothing is too hard for him, nothing is too difficult for him. So no matter how low we feel that we have been pushed down to the ground, sometimes because of our own stubbornness, sometimes because of our own waywardness, if we will look up and cry out to him, God is still able to hear our cry. His ears are never deaf, church. His arm is never short. 
his power is never abated. He still is almighty God with omnipotence in his hand, and he still can do great, marvelous, stupendous, and marvelous things on behalf of the church, on behalf of individuals, on behalf of families. No matter what the problem is, God is still able to solve and to fix them. Does anyone believe that today? Does anyone need God to do something big and great? Does anyone need for God to break through and for God to give you a breakthrough, to, for God to burst through a log jam, for God to bring you out of a spiritual slump? That if you believe that, then you ought to say hallelujah. That you're going to keep on trusting him and believing in him and serving him. And as we sung earlier this morning, you're going to ask him to use you every single day, wherever you go, whatever you have to say, Ask the Lord to use you in every way and believe that God can still get you in the place where he's going to meet you and he's going to bless you. And that was the final promise he was saying to Israel. The final promise he was saying for Israel is that even though you forgot me, I never forgot you. I still remember you. I still know where you live and I still know the promises that are made to you. And I also still know those things that were in your heart at one time how you desired to serve me, how you wanted to do great things for me. And I want to revive those things and bring those things back to life. And I'm asking the Lord to do that for each and every one of us. The Lord will once again stir up something inside of us. Stir up something inside of us. And there are times I think we've got to look at situations and we've got to look at circumstances and we've got to draw strength from what appears to be a bleak situation and a circumstance. You know, as we see our own dear sister Joel Mitchell going through this very trying time, it should stir something up inside of us. It should cause us to want to serve God and not only serve him for ourselves, but to serve him for her the way she served him and the way she would serve him and she was able to serve him. So it should rally us to a renewed commitment to be used by him to do great things on his behalf. As we still mourn the loss of our brother Steamboat, it should stir something up inside of us to want to serve God not only for ourselves, but to serve God in his stead, in his place, the way he served him and because he passed a legacy down to us of faithful service. And so as we come to this point in time in our history, I don't know about you, I just decided to just to dig in just to dig in, just to dig in and work harder, pray harder, preach harder, serve harder, give harder, to believe God for even more. And just as Israel was at this dark place, this bleak place, there appeared to be no hope, God gave them a vision and a word of hope, and I believe that God got a word of hope for us as individuals, as families, and as churches. Some of us are so beaten down in our own family situation, we are sapped of all of our energy before we can get out the door in the morning. I'm believing God to give you more strength and more grace and a greater anointing to be more patient and more understanding, but also to keep your joy in the midst of a situation that appears to be joyless. Because the joy of the Lord is still our strength. It's hard to serve God without joy. It's hard to serve God without something on the inside of us, swelling up on the inside of us, reminding us of how good God is. So every now and then, we just got to sit down and just count our blessings, what God has done on our behalf, how God has met our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, how maybe some other place might be hurting today, but it's a different place hurting today than hurting yesterday. So we thank God that both places are not hurting at the same time. Sometimes you got to look for something to thank God for. You got to look for something to bless God for because in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the despair, God is still moving on your behalf. God has not forgotten you, nor has he forsaken you. He's still sustaining you. Just like God sustained Israel all through their black situation, God still sustained them. He never left them. If he would have left them, they would have been consumed by their enemies, but he never left them. He sustained them so that he could discipline them, so he could bring them through the discipline and sit them up on a high place. Amen? Well, I'm out of my time. I thank y'all for yours. I'm really just getting warmed up, but it's time for me to stop. I done just broke a good, a good sweat up in here. But God is good to us, and we ought to serve him, be faithful to him, 
testify about what he's doing for us, how he's blessed the members of our family, how he's blessed our children, even though they're not living the way they're supposed to live, nor doing what they're supposed to be doing, but God is still keeping watch over them, and we're to bless God and thank him for that and not take that for granted. I told you all about Job last week. I'm going to tell you about Job again. The Bible says if you read in the book of Job, the Bible said Job offered prayers on behalf of his children. Job sacrificed sacrifices on behalf of his children because Job knew his children was living like heathen. He said, maybe they didn't curse God. And I got to stand in their stead, in their place, praying and interceding on their behalf. So we just can't take it for granted that our kids are going to wake up in the morning. We can't take it for granted. They're going to go out in these streets and be in these nightclubs and doing whatever they do over there. We can't take for granted they're going to make it up out of there. We pray and we thank God for protecting them and we rejoice in the fact that God is still watching over them and they're still at least in a position where they can repent. Will somebody help me? Where they can repent. And so God is doing things that we don't even realize how incredible it is what he's doing. Because things could be a whole lot worse than what it is. Amen? You know, the old saying, guy was walking around, he was melancholy, his head was down, and somebody said, man, you ought to cheer up. It could be worse. He said, I cheered up, and the next day, it got worse. <laughs> it could be worse, but it's not worse. And if it does get worse, God's going to be there with us even when it gets worse. And that's what we have the confidence of. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. Amen? Amen. Let's bow for prayer, shall we?